Welcome to Inspire Change, a new inspirational and motivational broadcast that strives to empower men in a positive way, designed to educate, empower, and inspire even the busiest individual on the go over that first cup of coffee. Please join me in welcoming Gunter Swoboda, international psychologist, author, speaker, and producer. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Inspire Change. Now, I'm going to change tack a little bit from the last few episodes uh, in which I really focused on turning points um, in in many different shapes and forms. Now, this may be, for many of you as listeners, an opportunity to reflect on could this be your turning point? Now, what am I talking about? Well, this week in Australia, we're looking at Men's Mental Health Week. Okay. Now, I'm not sure about the United States or the UK. You probably have something similar, but for us here down under, it's this week. And so why is this particularly important? Well, for lots of reasons. And many of you might think, well, that's a bit of a rhetorical question, possibly somewhat redundant. Um, But I don't think so. I think it is an important part of our community to highlight some of these issues. And um, a part of that is looking at, what, what, well, what are the statistics telling us at the moment? Now, the interesting thing is that if we look at just depression and anxiety and suicide, we know that about one in eight men experience depression. One in five men experience anxiety and about seven men a day die by suicide in Australia. Now, as far as I'm concerned, those statistics are fundamentally appalling. You know, we're a first world nation. And, you know, with all the technology and affluence that we supposedly have at our fingertips, you would think that, you know, we would be mentally in a much, much better place. I mean, some people talk about, especially the area that I live in, which is the northern beaches of Sydney, is paradise. Well, I can tell you that it's far from paradise if we're looking at statistics that include things like divorce, like the family court system and the battles that go on daily within it. It's not paradise. It could be, perhaps. Although I'm always a bit suspicious when anyone tries to sell me paradise. You know, really? So so the importance of this week is self-evident in many respects, but needs to be spoken about. Now, one of the challenges with the whole mental health field is that we... Again, and in this instance, you know, I'm citing psychological disorders and distress statistics. I'm actually not citing mental health, really. I see those as two separate parts. So in many respects, I could argue that, well, actually what we're looking at in some ways as a snapshot when we start is the unfortunate psychological state that many of us as men are in or that we experience through others okay so you know in this context I want to really focus on some of the positive things or constructive things that are important for us to change those statistics now many of those statistics of psychological distress and disorders are the result not just because that person, that individual guy has inherently got a some sort of predisposition to being depressed or anxious or suicidal. Far from it. And in Philip Zimbardo's framework, I would argue that for most part, uh, most Human beings, most men's disposition is not to be mentally, psychologically distressed or disordered. 
much of it arises through situations. My daily work with people in therapy and in counselling and in coaching tells me that. There are very few times when I sit down with somebody and I and I can, you know, I'll do an assessment and that person somehow has had an absolutely perfect life but is depressed or anxious or suicidal. It it just doesn't work like that. So the the issue here is that we need to include two other factors in Zimbardo's framework. One is situation. So what situation have I been exposed to that makes me potentially at risk of depression, of anxiety or of suicide? And the second bit, and this one is where we are so reluctant to engage, and that is the system that we are brought into this world of is flawed, it's toxic. And obviously, you know, as is my want, my argument is that, you know, as long as we have a patriarchal system, we are going to see that these appalling statistics and when neoliberalism and its economic ideology was let loose on the population, these statistics, I would argue, got worse. What we did better, firstly, was to identify the issue and secondly talk about it and work at destigmatizing psychological distress and disorders but it's not going to go away if we don't change the system and we if we don't look at situations appropriately in which these have happened it's not going to it's just not going to go away on its own it took us 10,000 years to get here and we worked bloody hard at doing that so if we're going to be really truthful about men's well-being and men's mental health we need to have a system that rids us of the shackles of patriarchal socialization that ultimately leads us into distress and death. You might go, boy, that's pretty dramatic. I'll go, well, yeah, it is. Because not only does it lead to suicide, but it leads often men into situations like war, terrorism, and so on. Most terrorist groups are fundamentally patriarchal. They're territorial, they're hierarchical, they're acquisitional, and they're competitive. My God, my belief, my land is more important than yours. And therefore, I can do whatever I need to do to shore up my territory, my position, my, whatever it is that I've required. And that is sick, pure and simple. But it's not only terrorists that do that, it's others as well. Okay, enough of my rant. Let me get into a couple of things that are going to support us as men really getting on top of this idea of well-being. All right, so firstly, if I'm going to talk about disposition, let's focus on building a resilient disposition from childhood onwards. And here's a clue. The Jesuits knew this from eons ago. They said, give me the boy before the age of seven and I will give you the man. And that's true then as it is now. So how does that work? Well, a lot of it hangs on the shoulders of us as parents whether we like that idea or not. Ultimately, my parenting has a monumental impact on my child's capacity to be appropriately attached to adults, but also then later on to peers and partners, and then parent again. Now, as an adult, what can I do to build this resilient disposition? Well, firstly and foremost, in a, in a society that believes 24-7 activity is the thing, 
you need to build some good sleep habits and you need to get enough of that sleep. You need to exercise. The number of teenagers that I see who either over-exercise or under-exercise is phenomenal, but a lot of them under-exercise because they spend 12, 14 hours on a game games machine, a PC or a PlayStation or whatever it is, uh, and they certainly don't get good exercise. They certainly don't get good sleep either. The other part of it is if we're going to really look at resilience, we need to learn effective relaxation exercises. We exercise our muscles, but we certainly don't exercise our mind wherein the body can respond. People see relaxation exercises like abdominal breathing and and uh, progressive muscle relaxation as something that's sort of like, you know, if you've got anxiety and if you really need to do it. My argument is far from it. That's as important as good sleep and as physical exercise. The benefit with relaxation exercises and mindfulness training is that you sort of can't do too much of it, whereas with exercise, you can overtrain. The next part in building a resilient disposition is you need to get on top of your nutrition. Uh, A lot of us men live on... It's gotten better, I have to admit that, but we used to live on junk food or takeaway, really fast foods. Now, some takeaways and some fast foods are actually not too bad, at least that's my understanding from some nutritionists. But the problem is nutrition isn't just the food, it's about the context wherein you eat it and your relationship to it. Um, Now, the other bit in nutrition, and I've done several podcasts on this, and it's the monkey, which is what are you doing with alcohol and drugs? And I'm not just talking the illicit drugs. I want you to look at the prescription drugs that you're on. Could a life, lifestyle change make a difference in what it is that you're taking there? Right? So, you know, all prescription drugs to one degree or another have some side effect. Now, don't misunderstand me. And if you want to make any changes, the first step for you is not to listen to me on a podcast, but to go to your GP and to discuss it. And then also check in with yourself about your mental state. You know, what's your stress levels like? Is there distress? Is there a particular predisposition? Have you suffered from trauma, whether that's childhood trauma or adult trauma? So once you've got that nailed, the next step is start practicing to become a psychological ninja. What does, it, what does that mean, right? Um, well, the thing that I always point out is we need to become more self-aware. And in the days of the you know, computer, the screen, the smartphone, which actually is a dumb phone, um, we're not that good at self-awareness. I can't tell you the times that I've come up to an intersection or somewhere and someone's been staring at their phone and almost walk and sometimes have walked into my car and then try to give me lip about it. Get your head out of the screen. Stop wearing ear, ear pieces all the time. You know, you know, we, we're going to morph into this bizarre creature that has absolutely no connection with the surroundings. Nature stops existing, which is a real worry. You also need to practice flex, being flexible. Flexibility is really important. Why? Because it's a precursor and in, inherent factor in being adaptable. Those things will make you already more resilient if you were to practice them simply on their own. Now, another another point that I want to bring up is that if you really want to get on top of this, then you need to work on being the best possible you. So what does that mean? Well, it means being tuned into some really decent core values. And a good way to start that is often a journey wherein we need to face our pain. And as I've said before, and as this, as a quote, you know, illuminate the darkness.